Let's look at an example that's indeterminate and introduce a method that one can use to solve indeterminate problems. This method happens to be known as the force method. And what I have here is a bar. It's built in at both ends, and it's subjected to a point force P in, at some location A from the left-hand side. And as a question I'd like to ask is, find the internal force field, the internal stress field, the internal strain field, and the displacement of the material at all points along the length of the bar. And so we'll have a deformable bar and we'll assume that the cross-sectional area and the Young's modulus are all constants for this problem. First of all, uh, to show that the problem is indeterminate, let's just look at a free body diagram of the entire bar. So I separate it from the two supports and there's a reaction force R1 at the left and R2 at the right. And so there are two unknown reactions, and there's only one equilibrium equation, the sum of the forces in the x direction. So I have two unknowns with one equation, so the problem is, in fact, indeterminate. So one way of dealing with such problems is to make them determinate. And the way we do that is we assume that one of the unknown reactions is actually known. And this seems a little bit crazy to do because we don't actually know what the reactions are because it's indeterminate, but let's go ahead and we'll assume it's known. We'll solve the whole problem, and then at the very end we'll try and use additional information that we know about the system to eliminate this extra variable that we've assumed that we know. So to proceed, let's go ahead and assume that R1 is known, and so I'll redraw the picture. So I'll have R1 as a force on the left-hand side, I have my applied load P, and I have my wall on the right side. And now this problem is statically determinate. So if I, I can start by making a section cut, say at some point before the load P, and I have this free body diagram here. So I have my internal force R, again drawn in the positive outward normal direction. And I can do the same thing if I make a section cut on the other side of P. I have, I'll have this free body diagram. Again, I introduce the internal force drawn in the positive outward normal direction. And from these two pictures, I can find out what R of X is along the length of the bar for any value of X. So for the points before A, I'll have R1 is equal, or R will be equal to R1, and for points after A, I'll have that R is equal to R1 minus P. And we can go ahead and make a, a graph of that. So it looks something like this. So there's it's a constant, then it jumps down, and the magnitude of the jump is P and then it continues on as a constant value. Knowing what R1 or R of X is, I can easily determine what the stresses are by dividing by the cross-sectional area, and I can also easily determine what the strains are by additionally dividing by the Young's modulus. So I divide by the cross-sectional area, and then I additionally divide by the Young's modulus. Okay, so this is the picture so far, but, and I, I haven't quite told determine what u of x is either yet, but we'll get to that. But one of the problems right now is that my answer is given to me in terms of r1, which I don't actually know. But to find r1, I can use the fact that I know the bar is built in at both ends. So I know that the displacement at x equals 0 and the displacement at x equals l are both equal to 0, which says that the change in length, the overall change in length of the bar is actually 0. So we can go ahead and use that fact to actually determine what R1 is because if I, I have an expression for delta, the overall change of length, that's the integral from 0 to L of the internal force divided by AE. Well, I have an expression for the internal force divided by AE, that's this graph up here. And so I can integrate that graph there and I find out, I find this result here for what delta is. But this is an equation that in terms of R1, I have R1 here and I have R1 here. So I can go ahead and solve this equation. It's equal to zero for R1, and that will actually tell me what R1 is. So I've used the kinematic information to determine R1. So if I go ahead and go through that exercise, I find that R1 is equal to P times one minus A over L. So that gives me an expression for, for R1. By equilibrium, namely that R1 is equal to P plus R2 from the overall free body diagram. I can go ahead and also compute what R2 is and find out that R2 is equal to minus A over LP. Having these two results here, I can go ahead and plug back in or say redraw my, my graphs here. 
and I can show that the internal force starts off positive, then it jumps down negative, and then the stresses and the strains also do the exact same thing. So the stresses are here and the strains are here, and they have the exact same look. So the stress is just R divided by A, and the strain is sigma divided by E. Uh, I can also draw a graph of what the displacement field looks like. The displacement field in this case is goes up linearly. It starts at zero, it peaks at x equals a, and then it goes back down linearly and is zero at x equals l. And the way that I determined that was by noting that u of x, the displacement at any point, is equal to u of zero plus the integral of the derivative of u from zero up to x. So I use the fundamental theorem of calculus again, which is also the same as saying that u of x is equal to u of zero plus the integral of the strain from zero to some arbitrary location x. Uh, and so basically we have this connection here then that the displacement field graph, the slopes of the displacement field graphs have to be equal to the strains. So we see that the slope of the first part is P times 1 minus A over L divided by AE. So that's actually the strain in the first part of the bar. And the slope in the second part is minus P times A over LAE, which is the strain in the second half of the bar.